So um, as those of you who have been to this weekend know, one of the highlights of it for us has been uh, the Harvey family members who actually had a hand in the business, who have great memories of the business, and we've had wonderful interviews here uh, and speeches about just the broadest possible uh, subject matter, everything from uh, Daggett Harvey talking about um, the years of the book that I didn't pay enough attention to um, and excoriating me for that, which is all fair. Um, and I do think that the time period that he worked in, in the company deserves better than, than he got. Um, to people talking about their personal memories, their, uh, last year we had an amazing talk by Katie Miller about uh, mental illness and addiction, not only in the Harvey family, but in the, I think in the hospitality business as well. Um, if you weren't here for that, I have to say there was not a dry eye in the house. Um, so every one of these family talks has been different. Um, and this talk this year is going to be completely different because it's going to be about music. Um, so Julian Harvey is the third of the three children of Byron Harvey Jr., Junior. Um, who was the son of Byron Harvey Sr. Um, and uh, what he and I have been talking about uh, for a long time, actually, is the role of music in the Harvey Company. And what is amazing is that after all these conversations, and every year we, I say to Julian, like, should we talk to you this year? And he's like, what would I talk about? And blah, blah, blah. And then um, lo and behold, I guess in August, or maybe July, uh, a bunch of us who were on the Harvey family email list serve got this email from Julian in Paris. Um, and he said, I wrote something. Um, and I'd like you all to listen to it. Um, and so I am thrilled to be able to... Um, have you listened to it? So this is a new composition by Julian Harvey, inspired by his uh, life as a Harvey. Um, this is a picture of him as a kid looking at his train. Um, this piece is called The Magic Train. Um, I think you will recognize its, um, some of its influences. And uh, given how this day is going technologically, I will just take a chance here. <laughs>
I have to say that it, it helps to steal good material. <laughs> so uh, when, when, I, uh, when I got this an email, uh, Julie and I started having, we had a Skype conversation, uh, Paris to Philly, and uh, we talked about music and we talked about, you know, he always says, like, I don't remember that much about the business, I wasn't in the business that much, but um, the music part of it is really interesting. I, I, I'm first curious, can you tell us a little bit about sort of what inspired this besides the Harvey Girls? I mean, what, where does some of the imagery come from? Um, w I was in France in, in Antibes, and it seems to me I was hearing an awful lot of Celesta music, if you can believe it, mm -hmm. in the restaurants and the bars and even in the pop music. So I think that sound got into my head. And so Remind I, me never to drink there. <laughs> Right, or maybe sh I should drink there. <laughs> uh, and so I had this idea of this kind of flowing thing, and I thought, oh my goodness, what do I do now? You know, I always joke well, in, in starting a piece, the first note's easy, the second note is a little bit tricky. Um, so, all right, we, let's move on to the fact that I've always wanted to contribute something to this event, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I never quite knew what. And I thought, oh, wait a minute, maybe I could do something with, with uh, on the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. So I, I threw that in, and it all seemed to work out very well. And I thought, well, maybe I can play it, you know, when the family gets together, and, you know, it's fun. I never expected it to end up here, I assure you. <laughs> uh, but, but here it is. I think it worked very well. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, in, in talking about this after you composed it and after you sent it to me, um, I actually did not realize, I mean, obviously people know that Johnny Mercer wrote the right. music for the, um, the mm -hmm. songs in the Harvey Girls movie. Mm -hmm. um, I really did not understand until you explained to me that Johnny Mercer actually had sort of a pre-existing relationship with your family yes. before this, mm -hmm. um, and that you had remained friends with him as a yeah. young composer trying to... Yeah. Uh, Get, uh, help, have him help you. Right, um, right. So why don't you talk a little bit about what Johnny Mercer was like and what, your, what his relationship was like with the family? Um, first of all, uh, my parents uh, were very good friends with the Mercers, but I don't think that had anything to do at all with the fact that Mercer and Harry Warren were hired to do the songs for the movie. I think the th two things were totally separate, mm -hmm. interestingly enough. Um, it's, it's interesting how this whole thing came about. There was a show in 1925 called The Garrett Gaieties in New York. Uh, you know, one of these chorus girl shows. There were a lot of those shows at that time. And uh, Rogers and Hart were writing for that. And the, the, this is of interest to me, if, if not to anybody else. The song Manhattan came out of that show. Uh, then the next year, 26, they did it again, and the song Mountain Greenery, also a great song, not as well known, I don't think, came out. So there was a little uh, gap in years. In 1930, there was another Garrett Gaieties. Um, there was a, uh, well, let, let me say, Johnny Mercer came to New York from uh, Savannah, Georgia, and he basically was going to be an actor, but he got into the songwriting game, and he wrote a song called Out of Breath and Scared to Death of You. <laughs> and, and this song actually was used in the 1930 Garrett Gaieties and made a big hit. Uh, in that show, there was a woman uh, whose name was Elizabeth Meltzer. She, uh, because of somebody else that was in another show, changed her name to, to the stage name of Ginger Meehan. She uh, eventually married Johnny Mercer quite soon, so it became you know, Ginger Mercer and Johnny Mercer. Uh, there was another woman in that show, uh, 1930, who was my mother. Um, so they became very good friends. That's how this, this whole thing started. Well, that's right. Your father was an actor. Uh, well, he was, but he wasn't in the Garrett case. But, but he wanted to be an, he wanted he did. To be an actor. He, he definitely did. And uh, there are people who think that's what he really wanted to do his whole life. I, well, he, he ended up in the Harvey Girls. He had a... He had a bit part. Small part. So, so in, in, in preparing for this, um, uh, Julian sent, sent me a couple of pictures. So these are... Um, imagine having Christmas at the Grand Canyon. I mean, I must say it must have been pretty cool for the Harveys. Um, to have Christmas at the Grand Canyon. What room is this? Where, where you is You know, this? I haven't the slightest idea. If you look at me, I'm quite young. And 
Uh, I, I really, I, I don't, I don't remember, and I, I don't know how it got so beautifully decorated, uh, but uh, it, it was fun. I want to mention, well, that's, I guess, it's a little hard for me to see from here, but that's Helen, that's my brother Ronnie, and uh, Theo, who took care of us, me. I guess that's Helen there. That picture fascinates me. That's my brother, and then I'm on the left there, and I'm 99% positive that's Porter Tamichi, uh, who I was just in awe of. I thought he was fabulous. Who and was I, Porter Tamichi? Uh, he worked for the Fred Harvey Company for nearly 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, he did the dances. He had, had dealt with the dances at, uh, at Grand Canyon. He worked in the Hopi House. Uh, he traveled for the company. He was really something. And I assume that's he, one of his sons, who I believe he's got, he had two, I believe, and they became muralists, I believe, or painters. Mm -hmm. I, I'd, I'd like to know, but, but there they are. So you sent me this very exotic picture yes. uh, of you and your mom and your brother. Right. Um, it, it is heartbreaking that, uh, that your brother Ronnie never got to come to this weekend because he would have had the best time. Uh, I got to interview him uh, not long before he passed away, and he was, mm -hmm. I think for many years, the most enthusiastic person and the one who was most incredulous that people didn't know about all this. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, he's, he's missing out, but he's getting it somewhere. One of the things that we talked about that I learned a little bit about, and I would love to see people do more research on, you knew only a little bit about, you know, the Fred Harvey Company had a history of orchestras. There were a number of orchestras um, Obviously, La Fonda had an orchestra. There was a Grand Canyon orchestra. And um, there were gr orchestras that played at Fred Harvey, like, Friday night dances. We have documentation of that all the way back to the earliest Harvey houses, the Harvey house in Lakin, you know, in 1879. Well, I could actually tell you the band that played there at the dance um, where, um, uh, where, where uh, Fred Harvey's sister-in-law met, uh, met Hardesty, the cattle rancher, because it was very, the music was just very much part of their lives, uh, yet we have very little, um, people haven't collected the record so much. I don't know how many of them are good, um, but especially uh, f up through the 1940s, there was so much music associated with the company. Maybe the Harvey girls just made it all seem so much smaller. Um, but I always thought like the exotic idea of the orchestra of, of La Fonda during the Second World War you know, as I think I've said here before, I do think someone should remake Casablanca um, at La Fonda. <laughs> um, um, and so let, let's look at some of the Johnny Mercer pictures. This is um, uh, not a great reproduction, but there's an Al Hirschfeld drawing that was done for the Harvey Girls, which I actually know, I've never actually seen the, fo the actual version of it, but it's actually quite amazing. There was all kinds of art associated with it. But you sent me this. So tell me what this is. Um, you know, in fact, it was my sister Helen who sent some of these pictures. Um, this is a watercolor that Johnny Mercer did. Uh, I'm not sure I've ever seen it. It seems to me I've seen another one where there are sheep on a hill or something like that. That's a, so, uh, you know, like so many and it's uh, people, your, he it's had several skills. Oh, I guess so. It's Santa Monica Pier? Yeah. Okay. I love the fact checking in the audience here. <laughs> Could you guys all come when we're fact checking my next book and just answer questions? That would be so great. Well, I've never seen this before, so I'm, I'm so it's, it's to Byron. Um, this is actually could be part of, you know, there, there actually are, I bet there are probably 20 paintings uh, by famous artists that are signed to the Harvey family. Um, it would be a fascinating show um, sometime. So, and these are just uh, pictures of uh, the Mercers and the Harveys hanging out, right? These are from your, well, that's either yours or for Helen's photo albums? I think that must be 860 Lakeshore Drive where we lived. Uh, they would come and visit us all the time on the train from, you know, Los Angeles to New York or, or back. Mm -hmm. And that was fun. And I met, their, you know, their two children. And as I've mentioned to you, I've corresponded with one of them quite a bit for some number of years. So th did you see him as mentoring you in some way? Was that what you, you were know, hoping for? You know, when, when, uh, when he first appeared on the scene, I didn't know who he was. I didn't know anything. And then slowly and s slowly but surely, I started, uh, you know, asking him too many questions and bugging him. And so there was a, there was a, a feeling of that. He helped a lot of people and mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of songwriters. He really wanted to. And uh, he, he was great in that respect. I don't know where that one on the left is, but um, 
and I don't, can't really read what it says. That's my mother's writing. Ginger and Johnny Ginger Mercer. Ginger and Johnny Mercer. New Year's, maybe? New Year's. I guess so. Well, it, was pretty, it was pretty warm on New Year's that year. Um, <laughs> I want to mention. I want to mention that. Go on to the next one. That picture, I'm not sure I've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. I was very touched to see that because, in attempting to get ready for this, I bought a, a DVD of the movie, The Harvey Girls, and on that DVD, uh, you can listen to the plain movie or. You can listen to a voiceover by the director of that movie, mm -hmm. George Sidney. Right. And he goes all the way through the whole movie and talks about everything you can imagine. Here's a picture of George Sidney with my father right. dressed up as a conductor in the movie. I was really moved. How to old were you when your dad that. was in that movie? Well, uh, the movie came out uh, in January of 46. I was two at that time. Okay. So you don't have a lot of personal memories of when it came. No. <laughs> okay, no, but I you do, and uh, so it, it, I don't, does anybody recognize this? This little painting here? It's right out, right. So it's right, if you go out that door, that painting is there. Julian has loaned it to the exhibit yeah. here. I will say this is my all-time favorite Harvey-related painting, um, uh, and uh, it's part of a series. There are a couple more uh, that the family owns that were done for Life magazine. Uh, in celebration of the Harvey Girl movie. And um, the family kind of split them up after. And uh, this is, uh, tell us about this. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a telegram. Actually, he, he seems to have sent it to my mother. But I asked him, uh, I, I sent him, I guess, a tune. And uh, he, he said he liked it, and he tried to get a lyric for it. Uh, he was not successful. I think he mentioned Tony Hatch, who did some songwriting back then. And Tony Hatch apparently showed no interest at all. But uh, uh, he, he sent this telegram. I'm not sure what the ecclesiastical music uh, reference is. I may have written some choral stuff or something. So that's what that is. And then this letter um, seems very encouraging uh -huh. um, to you. Um, Julian, without remembering the others too well, except one I told you is rather uh -huh. kernish, I think this is by far your most stylish tune. Yeah. So imagine being a songwriter and getting that note from Johnny Mercer. Yeah. Uh, that must have been kind of amazing. It was fun, yes. <laughs> so what, tell, can you tell us anything else about your relationship with him or just about the, the role of music? I mean, the, the uh -huh. songs from the Harvey Girls movie, did, did you love them? Did they drive you crazy at a certain point? Did you want them out of your life? Did, are you re-embracing them now? Well, uh, that's a very interesting question. I, to be honest with you, kind of avoided the movie. It, was, it just felt so close, and I just, it just kind of embarrassed me. I certainly n had heard the songs and seen the movie, but not carefully. I have, as I mentioned, seen it more recently, and I think it's a, a better movie than I was aware of. Uh, and I think that George Sidney was very proud of it and, and should have been. Um, so that's about all I can say. I, I love the, uh, on the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. I don't know if anybody caught the, the reference in the middle that I stuck in, but there's a song in there, which is, a, you can call it, uh, uh, well, one, is, one title is The Training Montage, and the other title is A Train Must Be Fed. Mm -hmm. And I, I stuck a little stuff from that in there, something about those are the requirements of a Harvey girl. I stuck that in. I don't know if anybody caught it. So uh, um, <laughs> no, uh, you know, historically, no, I didn't have that much interest in the movie, but I do now, clearly. And what other memories do you have just of the company, of growing up in the company? Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I that, that, that's interesting. As far as uh, being a customer, I used to go to, with my father often, uh, the grill in Chicago, which was in the Palmolive building. My wife, Catherine, used to go to, uh, what was that? Right. So uh, there was that. I worked for the company for one summer. I believe it was 1961. Mm -hmm. And I worked at the Fred Harvey Oasis. And I worked in... Wait, do you guys know what the Fred Harvey Oasis was? Raise your hand if you don't. Okay, a lot done. So explain what the Fred Harvey Oasis well, was. Well, it's, it's basically a steel and glass building which stretched across the Illinois Turnpike. There were about... The Illinois Tollway. Yeah. Tollway, Tollway. There were how many of them? There were five, I believe. But I was only in one of them, the Lake Forest. 
And I, I worked first in the snack bar and then in the retail where you basically clip newspapers, the wire around newspapers and stick them up on the rack. And, and, and you learn how to make change. Uh, in, the, in the snack bar, uh, it was something, it was much nicer inside where you could sit down, but the snack bar, uh, there was a gigantic machine that made milkshakes. And you take this big bottle of stuff and pour it in and then, and then press a button and the milkshake would come out and you'd give it to the customers. I was always very amused by that. <laughs> Did anybody want you to be in the business? I mean, what were the oh, kids I'm sure. encouraged to be in the business? Uh, of course, of course. And so when you but became I just, a composer, I just, what was that, how'd that conversation go? Well, I, I, you know, I went to law school and then I went in the army and, and uh, by the way, that was when all the, the, the earthquakes were happening about the, the, you know, the Fred Harvey collection and the merger and the going public and all that. So I just couldn't take much part in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know for a fact that my father would have liked perhaps my brother or me to follow up in, in the business. My brother says that in one of his writings that they were on the beach one day and my father said, you know, I wish somebody would come after. Um, we didn't. So what, what happened, and, and for those of you who haven't seen earlier talks of the company, the family members have talked about, you know, basically at a certain point in the 60s, uh, the next generation of the family who thought they were going to be inheriting and taking over the business mm -hmm. were informed that their fathers had just made them quite wealthy, um, but that they weren't going to own the company anymore. Right. Um, and uh, in a lot of ways, I feel like uh, the reunions that have come over the last 10 years um, around these things in Santa Fe, a lot of it has been healing from that. Because uh, every person I interviewed when I was working on the book talked about the pain of that. Mm -hmm. um, even though I don't think that running the company would have been that fun. <laughs> because I think by that time it was, it was less of a fun company and it, it, and it, was, it would have been hard. And, I, and I'm not sure that it would have been any different for, for you guys and the people who bought it. Um, but I understand the pain of people thinking that that's their family legacy. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Does it help a little bit that people are paying attention to Fred Harvey again? Um. Sure, it helps me. I'm thrilled by it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can take one or two questions, then we have to move on. Who has questions? Uh, does anybody in the fa Kathy, let somebody from the family ask a question. Um, where can the family download a song that you did? Do you want to share the song? Um, you know something? I, I, I'm, I'm, I may be overreacting. I'm a little concerned about copyright issues, but, you know. Um, if Johnny Mercer comes after you. Uh, he's going to. I'm telling you. He really is. Um, you know, I have a website. Say you're like a rapper. You're, you know, you're, just, you're sampling. I, I do have a website called julianharveymusic.com, and I could just stick it on there. We should do that. And if it is, we'll, we'll send you a link. Of course, until the Santa Fe Philharmonic performs it, maybe uh, we'll have a little string quartet here do that next yeah, year. Yeah. Let's uh, get somebody who hasn't asked a question. Uh, well, I don't know what to say. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of my uh, um, Aunt Laura. She had an ex exhibition somewhere, and she wrote, uh, a, you know, a description of her art. And she starts out with a lot of words and a lot of stuff. And then at the end, she says, in other words, I paint what I feel like painting. Um, that about describes my, my, my approach to music. I haven't had a huge amount of professional exposure. I've had some music published and a number of uh, performances in Chicago, but it, it, you know, it hasn't been an extensive career by any means. It's been uh, a lot of, I would call it neoclassical, you know, somewhat contemporary. I'm, I'm, I've done some um, cabaret stuff. I wrote songs for a show at the University of Chicago. Uh, I'm dabbling now a bit in pop music probably am not born to do that. Um, oh, well, yes, I wrote a, a mass. Uh, some of that's on my website. Um, there's a fair amount of choral music. So we'll post uh, Julian's website, um, and so we should share that around. Um, let's take one more question from somebody who hasn't asked one before, if we have one. Uh, you already asked one. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Go ahead. My mistake. Um, I don't, as far as I know, I don't, I don't know that there was any yes. problem. 
Um, I, I can answer that. Actually, we, we had planned to have a, a, a talk this year. We're going to have it next year on diversity. Um, Howard University did a project with the National Park Service on this very issue. So the interesting thing is that Fred Hart and, and, and the guy who was supposed to give the talk ended up not being able to come. He's, he'll come next time. Um, he explained a number of things. Interestingly, so the Harvey Company had a very good reputation. It did not separate seating. It did not separate housing. It's in the Green Book. So the Harvey houses that existed by the 50s are listed in the Green Books. Um, what this gentleman told me that I was flabbergasted by was that while El Tovar was open, the Park Service didn't give up Jim Crow laws until the 1950s. So no one ever asks the question of the South Rim being a place where both there are Fred Harvey buildings and there are Park Service buildings. But the Park Service had a different idea about separate bathrooms and separate drinking fountains than the Harvey, family, the Harvey Company had. That said, this all isn't well documented enough. So we have used a handful of things that we can identify um, that prove certain things and the reputation of the company, uh, not only in the white press, but in the black press. Um, one of the most telling things is uh, there's an article, I believe in the 1940s, where someone points out that somebody was treated badly because they were black and how surprising that was at a Harvey restaurant. Um, and Adam, we, uh, there's a piece that I quoted in my book that Adam Clayton Powell Jr. wrote um, in his utter disbelief that he was on a Fred Harvey dining car and African Americans weren't the servers, they were the managers. And he was going through Texas, and he could not believe that that was the case. So, but it, it's one of these things, that, and I do say, like, you're all here. Let's try to learn more about this, because it actually is a very rich tradition, and especially the parts that overlap with the Park Service, there's information. Um, but I think it's a really important question, because one of the things that we talk about, these guys from Howard, I just kept saying, there's, like, no black people in the West. You know, so they were surprised at the idea that the diversity in this part of the world is about Native Americans and Hispanic people and not as much African Americans, which they don't understand. So one of the things that they worked on is a plan to try to make it so that African Americans feel more comfortable at the Grand Canyon. Um, so this is what we're going to talk about, one of the things we're going to talk about next year. Uh, but it's a great question. Um, we're going to have to stop now because we have two more talks before the end of the day. Yeah. Julian, I want to thank you so much sure. for sharing this piece of music. Yeah.